welcome my partners in crime and I always say that in the nicest possible way as you know. Now today's case is the White House Farm murders case, new evidence. So is it a miscarriage of justice? Is it not? If it is, it's probably one of the British, worst British in history. I'm telling you, it's absolutely disgraceful. And I, it took me a while to research this case, I'll tell you now. Usually it takes me, what, 18 hours maybe. Sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. This one's took me over a week because it is a nightmare to get rid of all the stuff and the shambles of the investigation at the beginning, um, evidence that's only been released after a first year evidence rule and stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on in this case. So as I say, this is the White House farm murders and the real evidence. And I'm gonna leave it up to you as always to make up your mind, you know, really was Jeremy Bamber guilty of this crime or did Sheila herself? Was this a murder suicide, which the police initially thought it was? And to tell the truth, my own, and I don't very rarely give um, examples really of what I feel in a case but since looking over this case and looking over the evidence in this case, I'd have to agree with the initial investigation that this was a murder-suicide and that Jeremy Bamber is innocent of all the crimes that he's been charged with. And as we go through this evidence, um, it's up to you to make up your own mind. But the evidence is clear and I believe the evidence really doesn't lie. And I can't understand why this man has been in prison for 30 years for a crime. I don't think he did. So anyway, let's get on with the case. During the night of the 6th of August 1985, Neville and June Bamba were shot and killed inside their Essex farmhouse along with their daughter, uh, Sheila Caffell, and Caffell's two young twins, aged six at the time of their death, and their names were Daniel and Nicholas. It's a terrible crime, this one, really, and someone needs to be held account, but I think if I, I believe it was Sheila and I believe she'd done it because she was paranoid schizophrenic and she was having a psychotic episode at the time and I think if you, as you read through this case I'll leave it up to you but it's, it's you know there's no winners in this case there's only ever losers and I think really this case shows how just how bad a case can be you know when it gets this far where someone's not only and he hasn't lost his liberty because that's a wrong word for someone if they've been committed, you know, been charged with a crime that they didn't commit and to serve 30 years in prison. This man's life has been taken. It's been taken. He's lost everything of it and he's still fighting to this day for his freedom. So on that night, Jeremy Bamber was 24 years old. Now Jeremy Bamber says that he received a phone call from his father in the early hours of the morning to say that his sister had lost control, actually she was going crazy with the gun. Um, he then, Jeremy Bamba, then calls the police and says that his father had rung him and he um, was going to make his way to the farm but he said his sister was going crazy and told him everything the father had said. Also he said he tried to ring back the father but the phone was off the hook and he could no longer get through. So he was worried about the safety of his family, including his sister, Sheila, at that point. The police then made their logs and their dispatches and stuff, and we'll go into them a little bit later on, and you can see where now discrepancies come into this case right from early on. So um, when they got there, um, I think Jeremy Bamba got there just, just a couple of minutes after the police arrived at the farmhouse. Now the police that arrived at the farmhouse were unarmed. Uh, this is 1985. There was three police officers, I think, that attended at that point with Jeremy Bamba. Jeremy was then asked to stand back behind a cordon for his own safety because there was weapons then being deployed in his house, as he had said earlier, and also that Sheila was suffering from mental health and could have been dangerous. So we had now these three police officers who then had said about this gun, and so, of course, then... The armed police were then dispatched and it took them about four hours to get to the scene. But the other three officers and the other officers that they were arriving didn't enter the home or they also didn't leave that property at all. Um, some looked through the window and one of the officers that looked through the window at that point said that he had seen a 
or they was conversing with and talking to someone in his house. Then another officer had said that he was, he looked through the window and he'd seen a body of a woman laying between the hallway and the kitchen. And there was another body um, slumped over the chair near the fireplace. So this is what they're describing. At, all the, at this point, all of it, all of it is that Jeremy Bamber was outside this property. He never entered that property at all um, after ringing the police and meeting them at White House Farm on that night. Now, what happens after that is when the armed police come, of course, then they break down the doors and do what they have to do to break in this house to get in this house. At this point, then they found one body in the kitchen, which was um, the father, Neville, and he was slumped over. He had a broken nose and black eyes. Now, the black eyes were due to the broken nose. They knew he'd been hit with a the gun butt, actually, at that point, because a sliver of the wood gun butt was on the floor. He'd been shot eight times. Now, when I say eight times, and I, when I read this, I thought eight times, a bit of an overkill, really. But when we talk about this gun, and we'll talk about it a little bit later on about the bullet sizes, and I'll show you some pictures of these bullet sizes, and I've took it off this site, and I'm going to leave the link to this site because it's a great site. I don't know a lot about guns, okay, but you know, when you think someone's been shot eight times, I was like, oh, blimey. You know, this Neville Bamber was a fit man. He was um, six foot four at the time. He was presumably quite healthy. He was a farmer and stuff. So, you know, to take down a man when you think he's um, six foot two or six foot four, it, it's difficult, isn't it, to imagine that someone as, as small as, uh, well, she was five foot seven, um, Gina and she was 28 year old at the time she was suffering as I said from um, paranoid schizophrenia so there's issues there to, to whether she could have handled the gun or not of course she could have um, but when you hear him being eight shot eight times this, these bullets I think when you have a cliff of a, a pen you know and you, you need to get the ball out of the pen the ball point out of the pen these were tiny these were tiny bullets and you'll see in a minute on the here in the picture how tiny these bullets were. So when I say he's shot eight times, he was shot eight times, but not all of them would have killed him. Um, certain ones would have. But he was definitely hit in the face with the back of the gun, without a doubt, and um, that probably made him not really, it would have done him some damage, without a doubt, and it would have made him, you know, not able maybe to fight back as much. Or, or could he have fought back? And when you were thinking about this was his daughter and she was suffering mental health, you're trying to talk someone down, you know, you're not really attacking them, are you? If someone's got a gun, you're just sort of like, you know, you're trying to say to this person, come on, you haven't got to do this. And I think this is what Neville was doing. But unfortunately, with someone that's going through a psychotic episode, sometimes even what's coming out of your mouth when you're trying to tell them, you know, something, they're not hearing it. They're not hearing what's coming out of your mouth as what you're saying. They're hearing it as what they hear and what they believe to be true. And I think this is what makes someone in a psychotic state highly dangerous. And she was in a psychotic state. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So that's what happened in there. As they've gone then into the house and they've got police now all over this property, they found two bodies upstairs, and that was June Banfield. And um, uh, Sheila was also laying in the mother's bedroom with the gun across her pointing up to her chin. In the other bedroom upstairs they found the two bodies of the young children, Daniel and Nicholas, both been shot um, in the head in their bed at close range. So this is the overall experience I, I, I suppose that the police first noticed when they went in. You had uh, quite many logs taken, you had detailed, you know, evidence files taken of what was in the property and stuff like this, what was in the gun cupboard, everything. There was lots of stuff taken and, um, you know, big, really detailed notes taken of what was in this property. But what this police actually then did do um, is that they started to try and reenact what happened there. And um, this is when a few things went away with this case because they shouldn't have done that. 
they actually then tainted any evidence that was around at the point. There was crime scene taken, uh, photos taken a little bit later on, around 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, and um, they come into a little bit of relevance as well later on with this, this case. Actually, <clears throat> they play a big part, actually, in this case. And then um, they find Sheila and they find these bodies and then they tell, you know, Jeremy Bamber that his family is, is dead. And um, uh, the police put it down then to a murder-suicide and they was investigating that murder-suicide for about a month and still things started to change. Now there was a few things that changed at that point. One of them then was the um, silence that was introduced, the gun silencer was introduced. Now that was introduced from a family member of the Bambas, the cousin, I think, and the aunt, said that they had found the silencer in the gun cupboard and the silencer had had paint marks on the wall from the disturbance on the wall that they said happened on the night of the murder and there was also blood on that silencer and they said it was Sheila's blood on that silencer. So then that really contradicted, didn't it, um, the story of... Um, of all the cases it was coming out of how can it be a murder-suicide if she had shot herself and then took the silencer off and put it in a cupboard. So there was that one point, then there was a point where at first five or six officers including the actual police surgeon had said at the scene that Sheila only had one gun shot wound to her chin um, and uh, under the coroner, when I think he led, there was two so there were some issues going on there right from the beginning on this. Now there's lots of theories about why or if Sheila did have one or two gunshot wounds at the time. Now we have to think right back to when the first officer looked through the window and saw the body laying there in between the doorway and the kitchen. Because as I said, dead bodies don't move, do they? They don't get up and walk. And when we have to then also look at is the farmhouse itself, the manor house, because it's a large house and had multiple staircases, one leading off from the kitchen upstairs. So the issue is with the two gunshot wounds and where you have so many people that say there was one and then you have others now that say there was two. Now the fear is that this is, is that because we had the sighting at the beginning of this young girl laying there in the kitchen, the two bodies downstairs and the three bodies upstairs and now it's gone from one body downstairs to four bodies upstairs. Was Sheila dead? Did Sheila shoot herself the first time with this small calibre rifle um, without the silencer on it? And we come to the silencer in a minute. And she missed her target really, her neck, and she caught it. It didn't kill her. It may have knocked her out, it may have made her unconscious for a while, but then she recovered from that, crawled up the back stairs and shot herself in the mother's bedroom. That could be a theory and it's probably one that could have happened. The other one is that as the police were all over this place um, and reenacting stuff and doing stuff and just by accident the gun would have gone off and caused a second shot. Or it could be that Sheila did shoot herself, as I said, twice with a gun. It's not unknown for people that try to commit suicide that do not do it right the first time. And with her having only really grazed herself or hurt herself in a certain way, that she finished the job upstairs. So there's lots of different issues here. But the main issue about the two gunshots to Sheila was when it went to court and the prosecution's case stated about the two gunshots, it never said anything about the confusion before. It never said about anyone had just stated seeing one gunshot. It didn't state about the person being seen downstairs. They didn't state that there was some conversation going on with people within the house while Jeremy Bamba was outside beyond this police cordon to so he couldn't get harmed. There was none of that that come out in court. So now the prosecution have a job to do. Right? Of course they do, and they are, they are given the evidence and they run with it, okay? And so to, if you was doing a case that looked suspect right from the beginning, then, um, you know, where other evidence had been left out or misused or 
not brought forward or, or put aside because you're blaming people and we'll go through this in a minute. Um, you know, things can get complicated. I think the other thing with the case, on this case that really stands out, is that what they're saying about Sheila with the silencer, because now they're saying the silencer was on it because a family member member brought in the silencer about a month later and said about the marks over the wall and that in the fireplace. So it was there was a ensued a fight went on and um, Jeremy ba Bamber could have overpowered um, Sheila very easily and took the gun off her. Um, so it couldn't have been her. It must have been Jeremy Bamber that he was fighting with because these marks on the wall showed that there had been a struggle and that it also showed that at the time of these murders that the silence had been on the gun. That was also discredited really when you look now at the evidence that's come out on the um, crime scene photos. Now crime scene photographs are really, really important. And you also have people that are expert in crime scene photographs and they don't just look at the photographs, they actually look at the negatives. So that means there can be no distortion from the actual negative. No one can have altered them pictures in any way. It was from the negatives that they took their analysis of the crime scene uh, in 2010. And it shows then that the crime scene photos from the um, negatives showed there was no marks on a wall. So if there was no marks on a wall caused by the silencer, that was meant to be on the gun that night. And then marks were created about a month later, after the crime. Then that proves that there was no fight. The Jeremy Bamber was not fighting with anybody to get the gun off them. The gun with the silencer attached. And the silencer just mysteriously turns up in the cupboard even though the police had done a detailed log of everything that was there and the silencer wasn't there. And then they said that the silencer had the paint from the wall, which it did have. It had the paint from the mantelpiece, the same colour and everything. It also had blood on it. And they said that blood belonged to Sheila, saying that she must have been used to kill her and then removed. And as we say, not only can a dead body not move, but a dead body can't also take a silencer off a gun. And this was the prosecution's whole case, really. And I think when you look at this case, now we can get rid of the silencer because we know now that the crime scene states really in clear terms that if there was no marks created by a silencer on a gun on the night of the crime, and it was created later, then someone's been fitted up here for murder, aren't they, really? I think that's the only conclusion you can come to. If the marks were made after the crime scene, after the crime happened, then they're no part of the crime and therefore can't be used in evidence, nor can the silencer. And I think in 2018, when the forensic report came about the blood or the fluidity of the evidence relating to the silencer, you know, it was held that uh, there was big doubts over this. And then you have to think, well, why would someone bring into a police station a month later a silencer with parts of the paint from a you know mantelpiece in a crime scene and with blood on it and say that this proves that you know she couldn't have done it what was their reason and this is you know <laughs> I'll leave this up to you to think why there's actually other things in this case that really prove that Jeremy Bamba couldn't have done this crime. So let's state now with the official coroner's report, which was done on the 9th of August, and that stated that the appearance suggested that in the case of Sheila Cathell, the wound had been inflicted by her own hand. That's what they stated on the 9th of August. Two days later, inflicted by our own hand. We had all these police officers, didn't we, seeing this gunshot wound, this one single gunshot wound, and even the coroner is saying that. But so then everything changes on the introduction 
of a silencer. And then other people come forward, don't they? Like the ex-girlfriend comes forward with her statement as well. So on the 7th of September 1985, a month after the murders, Judy Monkford. Now, she changed her statement to police. So at first she alleged, because she was in London at the time of these killings anyway, not in Essex at all. She alleged that um, on that night of the murders, that Jeremy had rung the police and then rang her or had rung her first and told her that this something happened at the farm and he had to go. A month later that story changed. She actually said then that she was alleging that Jeremy had told her that he was planning to kill his family. And then, <laughs> and as a result of a second statement, the following day, he was arrested. So not only did she say that he was planning to kill them and had been planning to kill them, she actually told him that he did it. That's what she said. And um, so, of course, you know, I think I have to say with Julie Mugford that she was an ex-girlfriend. She had been with him throughout the funeral. But let's be honest, this man was 24 years old. You know, I think Judy wanted to be the, you know, lady of the manor. So I think with Julie Bamford, she was, how can I say it, pissed off. She was really discarded. He didn't want to know her anymore. Listen, he had been having affairs anyway. He had, had such a close relationship with a male friend as he did with her. It was on its way out even before um, his parents died. You know, it was never going to be a long-term thing. It just wasn't. And so, is this the reason why she changed her story? I don't know. Could be. Or is there other reasons? Now, she had met him, actually, Bamba. It's like dating about 1983, when she was 19, and she was just, um, studying a degree in education at Goldsmiths College in London. Now it's important, you see, when you understand what she was studying, because to be a teacher, I mean, she was studying education. So to be a teacher, you can't have a criminal record, can you? You really can't. And you certainly can't have a criminal record of fraud. And you can't have a criminal record of theft. So there's a lot about Julie that will come out in a little while, when we go more into her story, of why maybe she did this and said these things that maybe not be true at all. And I think the thing is with Julie Mumford, is when you really think about her, because now she's left the country soon after this case was dealt with and everything else, she left and moved to Canada and started her life as a teacher and now as a head teacher, I think, somewhere. But this could never have happened if Judy wasn't given immunity to them things for giving her testimony against Jeremy Bamba. Because Julie, naughty girl was Julie when she was a bit younger, her and her friend decided, and it was with a bank and they had a, um, a checkbook in them days, I don't think we have them now, do we checkbooks, but we did. And her friend had a chequebook and they decided that they would spend on this cheque between them about £700. I don't know if it's each or between them, but it's quite a lot of money in 1980-odd. And uh, then say that the chequebook had been stolen and it wasn't them that had the money. They was caught for that. Okay, she was caught for that. So that's fraud. That's fraud. So that would be enough if you're doing a degree in education. You ain't going to work in education with that sort of criminal record on you, you're just not. And then she also disclosed to the police, now she's disclosed this to the police, this is not something that I am bringing up or def, you know, defaming her for, this is what the police was told in an interview and they all, she also told them that her and Jeremy Bamford, um, Bamford told, um, stole money from the caravan site that the parents owned, about a thousand pounds as well. So there's the theft. So, can't sue me, tell them the truth. Unlike some people. So, what happens is then, you're saying, what's this got to do with this crime? Because what's this got to do with this crime is there's a letter from the prosecution that's asking Julie to give testimony 
against Jeremy Bamber for <laughs> the murders to say what she said to them, make a statement, say it all, go to court, do what you've got to do. And then charges would all be dropped and then Julie can go off with her life and, and plan her life and get on and be the teacher she is today. Which she would not have been able to do with them sort of offences against her name. So that's one mark against Julie Mumford. She had something to lose and a lot to gain by giving a statement, really. So then we think, okay, she's then gone off to um, Canada. But before she goes off to Canada, you see, she'd done an interview. And she'd done an interview with, uh, you know, the great paper that it was, if you'd like to say that, the News of the World. Now the News of the World was well known, and the News of the World reports are telling the truth straight out. They didn't care if he was telling the truth or not, they just wanted the story. And they paid Judy Monkford £25,000 in 1986 for her story on him, on the evidence that she had against him. So Judy well, had a win, 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 win all the way through. Now Julie now doesn't like to be reminded of this case because really she wants to forget it. Oh, I bet she does. But as the new evidence is now coming out in this case, um, you, I mean, people that lied, and, and if she had lied, and I don't know if she did, we don't know, if she did, then she needs to be really careful because if you've lied for that, one, because you're a jilted lover, you've took money for your statement, you've got off with criminal charges because of your testimony that you've given, they do this a lot, you know, this is not just for her, they do this a lot. But the man that you've convicted, or the man that you've said these things about is innocent, and can soon probably, with all the evidence that's coming out here, be proved so, I think you should be worried yourself about any criminal um, proceedings that may be coming your way, because I think if I was Jeremy Bamba, and I actually got off this case, with what I would be out to sue everybody in this case by this point, because the 30 years they've taken from this man, shocking, really, for what? I'll leave that up to you to see what you think about these people. Now, this letter that she that they, was found, and I think Bamba's lawyers actually argued this on the 26th of September 1985, and this letter to Monkford from John Walker, the Assistant Director of Public Prosecutions, raised the possibility that she could that she had been persuaded to testify in hope that she ch um, that the charges against her would not be pursued, and they wasn't. In the letter, Walker had suggested that the Chief, Chief Constable of Essex Police, with considerable hesitation, that Monkford would not be prosecuted for drug offences, burglary, cheque fraud, and offences like that, that she had con to confess to in the police interview regarding Bamba. So, can't be sued if it's true. Anyway, the defence team also highlighted that soon after that verdict was announced, she sold her story to the News of the World and, as I said, got 25,000. And in today's equivalent for her story, it would be £74,000 that she got for her story. So the 25,000 then, today, would be about £74,000, £76,000. Not bad to set yourself up on, is it? Really? Now these scratch marks and these marks, and I think um, the, the, the defence got this expert. Now his name is Peter Savrist, and he's a British forensic photography, ph photographic expert. So this was in 2008 that he examined these, 2008, I was even wrong, I thought it was 2010, it's 2008, that he examined these um, photographs of the kitchen and also on the day of the murder and the later ones and showed the discrepancies in the two. Now his date reported now 17th of January 2010, so I was sort of right. He argued that the scratch marks and the red paint work from the kitchen and the mantelpiece had been created after the crime scene photographs had been taken. That's the experts for you now, right? So there's another knock on the prosecution's case. And as I've said, they've, the prosecution said that this is about the struggle and it's proven now that that can't be. So there was no struggle. 
and there was no silencer and there's no marks on the wall, then Sheila could have done it, couldn't she? Of course she could. When you've got Jeremy Bamba standing outside with a load of police officers, of course she could have. I think the photograph evidence man, the, the expert, he said that the photographs with the marks on the wall were taken 34 days after the murder. 34 days after the murder. At the time when people were in that home, remember the family wanted to secure, secure that property. They wanted to secure it because of all the stuff that was inside it. Quite a lot of valuable stuff. And they're the same people that found the silencer and took it to the police. I think this is one of the most important things with this case, is the arguments about the police logs. Now the police telephone logs had been entered in as evidence during the trial, but had not been noticed by Bamber's lawyers. Now, I, I, you know, I always say, don't I, if you're going to be a lawyer and you're going to do defence or you're going to do prosecution, know your stuff. Who would not? What defence would not look at the police locks and use them as evidence that would help you to win your case? Because they're clear. Now, Bamba's new defence team, of course, have gone for this and their new, you know, um, appeal stuff they put in uh, for submission, is, this is part of it. But, you know, it's a disgrace to think that his first lawyers didn't notice this, didn't take up this the log, which is such an important part of this case, uh, it's shocking, really. So it's no wonder, you know, the, the prosecution must have just been like, right, you know, they haven't even seen it. I mean, if you're going to do law, do it right. I just, I just don't get it. I just don't get. This is the bit I don't get. You know, you, you, a defence team is there to defend your client, no matter what. And the problem is, is this evidence was clearly there in plain sight to see. And you think, what what was they doing? I just don't understand, that's the bit I don't understand. And as I said in this case, you know, the whole thing has been a shambles from the beginning. It's a mixture of this, that and the other, and to get through all this stuff, to try and get to the fruit of the truth. It's been very, very difficult. Actually, nearly two weeks, I think, I've worked on this case, just looking through the crap that is there and then to find that you know this really and I think even Bamba must be thinking my gosh even if his first lot of lawyers had noticed this this case probably wouldn't have gone as far as it had gone it could have because you know but you never know but I don't think it would have if it had had a good dis defense team at the beginning that used this evidence the way it should have been used and at least you know brought it in uh, Things could have turned out a lot different for him. Anyway, police telephone logs have been entered into evidence, um, and as I said, not not even noticed really by Bamba's um, lawyers. So the new defence team did submit it. Now the new the what this shows is is it's not just the logs, but it's the radio logs as well. Because in them days, the police were on the radio. I mean, these days we've got more in the car stuff, haven't we? But it shows Neville, Neville called the police on the night saying his daughter had gone berserk. Not just Jeremy. This is the most important part of this case and it was missed. There were so many phone calls coming in. So we know now that Neville had run his son, Jeremy. Jeremy had run the police. Now I always think to myself, if you've got something going on, why aren't you ringing the police? Neville did ring the police. He did ring them. And I think because the two names were similar, and what they said was similar, and the timing was similar, they got lost. And his, that's what he says. Neville called the police. This is in the log. This is a police log. Not Jeremy Bamba saying it, not someone else saying it, a police log saying it. He had a saying that his daughter, and that daughter is word, because if it was Jeremy Bamba, 
he'd be saying my sister has gone crazy, which he did. Now Neville's saying my daughter has gone berserk with one of my guns. That's what was said. So, now we know that she was doing it. Neville's told you, he's rung up the police and told you. Now, at the same time, we've got other calls coming in from Jeremy, haven't we? At the same sort of time. Same thing being reported, out, sent out to the police in their rate with their radio locks. So there was some confusion there. Shouldn't have been, but there was. Now, a separate log on that police radio message shows that there was an attempt to speak to somebody inside that farmhouse that night. As police waited outside to enter, waiting for the armed response to come. But there was no response. Police say that the fact that the officers simply made a mistake. Now you'll see, right, when we talk about this case, how many mistakes the prosecution or the police say has been made. And it comes down to their own officers. So what they're saying, no, that didn't happen, that was a mistake. Even though the radio log states it. But no, that's a mistake. Okay, so, okay, think, one mistake. Let's see how many more they've got. Now, the other logs was when the phone calls came in. So you had the police officer who took the call in the police station from Jeremy Bamba and then radioed out or sent it out. And there was about a few minutes time difference because, as I said, there was issues with the phone calls coming in from Neville Bamba at the same time. So to discard this, to get rid of this, to eliminate this, the prosecution had said that the officer that was logging the phone calls must have got the times wrong. He must have got, you know, the digital clocks ticking around. He must have got the time wrong. So that's the second mark, isn't it, then, to the police? Because, you know, they've got quite a lot of things wrong. There's two now that even though it's wrote down, it's on a log form, it's logged in, it's radio through, the radio logs say that, the radio logs say a lot of stuff, um, <laughs> they're wrong. Them officers are wrong. Even though it's all been logged, timed, date, they've done their job right, they're wrong because it doesn't fit with the prosecution's case of Bamba. So they're not wrong about Bamba being the killer. These police officers are wrong about what they've seen or what they've heard, whether the phone calls have come in. Then there was other phone calls, but they said Bamba never made, you never made your, that, you never received a phone call from your father telling you about your sister. You only knew they was dead because you did it. There was no way that you that, that he rang you. We know he didn't ring you. Well, that's untrue. Because the record show that there was a phone call made, actually, from Neville to um, his son on that night. There was. There was also a phone call made from Neville to the police that they seem to have lost. There was also a phone call from Jeremy to the police. That they've got that one. Everything else though, they haven't got, or it's a lie, or it's, a, you know, it's mixed, it's, they've mixed up. They've mixed up, they were too close. The son, the daughter, my daughter has gone berserk. My sister has gone mad. She's crazy with a gun. But they've mixed these up. You know, the logs don't lie. So then the phone calls, and as I said, they said he didn't do that. Of course Neville didn't ring you. He couldn't have rang you because the phone was off the hook. Well, they, they knew then, they checked the records with the phone records, and it came out that there was a phone call from Neville to his son. And then after that, the phone was left off the hook. 
after that. They checked it. It's all checked. It's all done. So what part is Jeremy Bamba lying about? But let's move on, really. So now the family members, right, don't like Jeremy's attitude. So they say. They also want to get in this house because of all the expensive stuff in this house. They want to secure this house. These are the people that also found the silencer, handed it into the police officer, that then started this ball rolling as to make Jeremy Bamba out to be the killer. He is not. Now, the initial investigation said, didn't it, that um, Sheila had killed them, all of them. It's murder-suicide. And then turned the gun on herself after she did all that. Now, a lot of this... Listen, families never want to believe, do they, that that can happen. But they also said about Sheila's personality, she was soft, she was quiet. I mean, you know, I don't understand what they think that mental health can do to someone, especially paranoid schizophrenia, can do to someone's personality. It changes you. It changes your life. It changes your outlook on life. Because you're unwell. She was going through a psychotic episode. There was no way this woman was happy and calm and singing, you know, putting up daisies and all this sort of... This, this wasn't what this girl was like. This girl had said her own children were the devil children. Five months earlier, she had come out of a mental institution where she had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. She was undiagnosed. Um, she was diagnosed with something other than that. Uh, like phrenia but not schizophrenia, not in that sort of way until after that. Um, she believed that her husband or her ex-husband was trying to kill her as with others trying to kill her. Because people with schizophrenia, where they're so ill and they've then become into this psychotic episode, believe it. They really believe this is what's going on. She believed that she could make her children do things to people, including sexual things, as she said, and other people have said this about her. You know, these kids were six years old. This woman was struggling. This woman was ill. This woman was psychotic. There was no way this woman was normal, calm. There's no way. Yes, her first personality, her personality before schizophrenia may have been this lovely girl that didn't pick up a gun, that didn't argue, didn't fight, didn't do anything. But the other girl in her mind, in Sheila's mind at that point, on that night, she's fighting for survival, really. They're going to kill her, so she's going to kill them first. And, you know, People with schizophrenia, many people with schizophrenia don't go that far. There's lots of different types of schizophrenia. And a lot of medication works on it, and we'll go into her medication in a little while, what she had. Sometimes it doesn't. When you're mixing drugs and you're mixing other things in with antipsychotic medication, it changes really how that medication is going to affect you. She was psychotic without a doubt. And she'd probably be in a psychotic state for a good few days or weeks leading up to that because she was telling people. She had made it quite clear that even when she was in the hospital, when she told the psychiatrist that she had feelings of killing her children, she'd said it five months prior to that. The relationship that people with schizophrenia have with their children can change. It can, because they're changing. They have got no control over what they're thinking or feeling. They really haven't. So for Sheila, maybe she thought she was saving them or saving herself to do what she did. But there was a reason why Sheila done it. There really was. And it was because of mental health. She is another victim whether she had done it or not. She was always a victim, Sheena, because of the best state of mind. And probably, even though they tried to help her in 1980s, 
did they really understand about the complex issues of schizophrenia. It wasn't accepted. People tried to hide it. And this is why Jeremy Bamber didn't want people to know what she was doing. We don't know if she'd done things before that day, tried different things or said things before that day, because people don't want it known. They didn't want, especially in them days, they didn't want it known that there was mental health in their family, didn't want to come out. And I think on that day, Jeremy had said that June had said to her that maybe it's time that the kids went into like a foster care or something for a while to give you a break because they had done that before. She, they had to go into a foster home before when she was unwell. And that could have been the trigger, couldn't it? That could have been it. She thought the husband, ex-husband was against her. She thought the father was against her. She thought the mother was against her. She thought her children were the devil children. You know, could her mind take any more? As Jeremy came in from shooting his rabbits that day, did she just pick up the gun and thought, that's it? And a lot of people have said, with people with schizophrenia, you know, um, why didn't she kill him, Jeremy, as well? Jeremy was no threat. He was no threat. Actually, I don't think he cared that much for her. He had real no interest in her. He didn't care if, you know, he's 24. He didn't care if she was um, staying there or staying at her own flat in London or wherever she had the kids. He didn't care. He had his own place, his own life, and he was out living life. And so to her, he was no threat. The mother was a real threat, and we'll talk about her in a little while. So before we sum up this case, I want to talk to you a little bit about Sheila in more detail. Not about her mental health, but about the things that may have created her mental health and also that may have took her over the edge of that. So in 1974, I said when she was 17, that she discovered she was pregnant and the Bambas then arranged for an abortion for her. Her relationship with her mother then deteriorated really significantly after that. And also the person that she was um, subsequently to marry was the father of that child. Um, and I think she was then still seeing this bloke, and um, this is the children's father. And um, Sheila and him then used to, you know, sunbathe naked, I think Connolly's name was, um, used to sunbathe naked in the fields, just like you would, you know, these, these young people and they're living life. But the mother used to call her the devil's child after that, she couldn't stand her. She'd had this abortion that the family had had to arrange. Then she was now, you know, doing more things in, in this field with this lad. Um, and um, the mother was just so religious and, and stuff, it really affected their relationship. The mother had been known to be in and out of the psychiatric unit anyway, I think just after they, when she got um, um, Sheila, because they were both adopted, Sheila and, and, and him, and Jeremy. And I think after Sheila, she really um, had to have electrotherapy and stuff, and she was um, a depressive as well. But she was really um, what you would call someone who, who wouldn't tolerate anything, and it was all religion. She would make you pray on your hands and knees and beg for forgiveness. The children, even on that weekend when they was going there, asked their father, you know, to talk to Jean about not making them pray so much and stuff, and really found it they didn't really want to go and it wasn't so much about their mother, it's more about Jim they didn't want to go for. So there were some issues in this family and, and things went on. But anyway, um, Sheila and Colin married in the end and um, it finally, I think they had a miscarriage and then I think two miscarriages and then she had to lay up for about five months or four months rest to have these twins. And just after she had had the twins, uh, Colin left her for another woman. So her mental health had gone down and downhill. Now, um, you know, the thing is people really don't know why you get schizophrenia. Just, they don't know, but sometimes it can be down to shock or injury or whatever. Um, and I think this girl, her mental health just started to deteriorate. Then she started to hit the drugs scene and stuff, and she had done some modelling, and she'd worked in Tokyo, I think she'd done modelling for some company, but it was not for very long. She'd only done one part of that. She had trained to be a hairdresser, but she had taken a lot of drugs. 
and so it could have been drug-induced schizophrenia, which is um, probably a probability, actually. That's what caused it. Um, then she's left, isn't she, with two children, and she's divorced, and she really, then her mental health really gets really effective after that. I think she was hospitalised once, and um, I think the same psychiatrist that her mother used that she used at that point. I think the main thing that put Sheila over, put her over the edge in this relationship, and she become really increasingly more and more upset. And on one occasion, when Connie had left her on her twenty-first birthday, so don't forget she was only very young, right? Very young. Um, he left and went off with another woman. And after that was, I think, her first time that she required hospitalisation for that. Um, literally, um, she broke down and she also broke a window with her fist and that. And I think in 1982, the couple divorced. But that was the point of her mental health deterioration, was from then. And don't forget, this was three years later that these people were murdered. So after she was divorced, I think Neville brought her a flat in uh, um, Maidervale and Colin helped raise the children between them. But at some point in this time, these children was put into foster care for a while. Um, they didn't, and then I think Colin got them back and then he started to have them and she and that, you know, co-parented in a way that she could. Now, because Sheila was adopted, she then tried to also, I think, to find some happiness in her life and she tried to find her birth mother uh, and that she was living in Canada and they met once at Heathrow Airport, I think in 1982. It was a very brief relationship they had and it didn't develop any further than that. So I think for Sheila that was another letdown as well. So when we're looking at the mental state of Sheila, it was always rejection or loss for Sheila. Her mental health was deteriorating, her drug use was still there, probably self-medicating, as many people do at that point. And um, she started hanging around with a group of girls and that, and they used to call her Bambi. And they later told reporters actually that she was so insecure um, and always complaining about her relationship with her mother uh, or her adopted mother. She just constantly went on about it. The group partied a lot um, and uh, partying with drugs and with older men. And the drugs at that point wasn't just marijuana, it was cocaine and, um, you know, she really did fraternise a lot with um, older men and went to parties where there's lots and lots of drugs, which would only have made her mental health worse, especially if she had onset schizophrenia coming through drug, drug induced it could have been and it was paranoid schizophrenia the more you're dealing with people where they take the drugs on especially like cocaine and stuff and even marijuana at that point because of the tendencies it has to make you paranoid made this girl quite an unstable girl so I think after this breakdown this really serious breakdown that she had after the boyfriend and stuff. She was actually diagnosed by the same doctor, this Stu Ferguson, a uh, psychiatrist who treated her mother, Jean. Now, she was um, sent to a private hospital for that, St Andrews Hospital, um, and really he diagnosed her with schizoaffective um, disorder. But later, actually, um, he then changed that diagnosis and to um, paranoid schizophrenia disorder. So now she, um, at that point, did tell him that she wanted to kill her children, but he said that really she was, uh, you know, safe. Now, as I said, in 1985 or never, schizophrenia was, uh, I mean, it's private hospitals, this, that and the other, she was medicated. And I think with what the actual psychiatrist has said and with what now the prosecution has said about her is that she couldn't have done these crimes because she had schizophrenia and she was medicated. So the drug that she was given was haloperidone. So it was the first generation of that drug. Now this medication works on the brain to treat schizophrenia 
was what she was then diagnosed with and that's what she had. It's also known as this first generation antipsychotic or FGA um, or typical um, antipsychotic. Haloperidone is, um, rebalances the dopamine and it improves the thinking and the mood and, and the behaviour. Right, so it's meant to take away them psychotic faults. Now, at one point, she thought that she was the devil's child, and could, and her children were also the devil's child, and that she could then focus things onto other people's minds to make them do bad things, including her children, including sexual things. Um, also, with um, her in that later stage just five months before these murders, she believed that she was God, okay? So she was very, very unwell at that point of when these murders happened. Now she had been on monthly injections, so like depot injections of haloperidone, and it said, or well, the prosecution would like you to believe that then she was so doped up from that that she couldn't have possibly done these murders. Actually, hyper, um, haloperidone has got lesser side effects than some of the others. And the, one of the lesser side effects is the drowsiness that comes with a lot of the others. Because risperidone today is the same sort of thing. And um, it doesn't really create drowsiness. But it also, there is no schizophrenic medication at all that can clearly get rid of all your symptoms. It can't. It causes anxiety and depression and other things. You usually haven't got schizophrenia, you've got other disorders that go with it. And anxiety is a big one. Paranoia is still a big one. And if you're then adding drugs, illegal drugs, A-class drugs, into the mix, you are highly then capable of doing a lot more things because the, the antipsychotic medication can't work the way it's meant to work because whether you're having an injection monthly or not and obviously the reason that she was having a monthly injection would have been because she wouldn't have took her tablets as with most people that suffer from severe mental health like schizophrenia disorder once they're feeling better they don't believe they need their medication anymore and so they stop taking it it's a well-known fact now she couldn't have stopped to get, taking it because she was having the injections, but she'd only been on the injections for four months, and in that even in her bloodstream in that day of the autopsy, she had cannabis in her system, which would have affected the outcome of that drug. So yes, she could have picked up a gun, which was already loaded, ready to go, use. No, she didn't like guns. She wasn't known to use guns a lot. She had been on a few shooting parties and stuff like that, but she wasn't a gun user. But she was well used to guns. She was used to seeing guns, whether she liked them or not. It's the life on a farm. She was used to it. She was brought up with it. She was brought up in that lifestyle. So to say that her character had changed or she wasn't like, you know, or she was just a soft person, um, no, schizophrenia changes your personality. That's what it does. It will change how you see the world and how the world, or you think, the world sees you. That's what schizophrenia does. It can change and cause delusions. It can make you feel you're something you're not, like God. You're empowered. As I've said before, if Sheila did this, did she do it? because she was in such fear for her own life, because her paranoia about that. Or did she do it to save these people? You don't know. And we probably never will. Because really, Sheila was lost in all of this. One, because she was either a victim, or she was a perpetrator. But either way, Sheila was always an innocent victim in here. Because if she did these murders, it was because she had such bad mental health that she couldn't have controlled what she was doing. She just really could not. And that's what makes this so sad, isn't it? This case, it really does. So let's sum up this case now. Okay, let's sum up. 
And let's now see what you think about this case. So after all I've done on this case, I don't know. I'm still confused because I, I don't believe he done it. I, I, I don't. But I think how it became, even got to this, I don't understand it. So let's see what you think. So the whole point of the how the prosecution came together with their case is because they said that Jeremy Bamber done this murder because of the inheritance. He wanted it all. Right? He wanted it all. And they said this because they, were, they said there was no way that the father had run him at all. That was a lie. That's what they're saying. That Jeremy Bamber's father, Neville, never called him. The only reason that Jeremy Bamber knew of these murders is because that he committed them. It was a big setup, which I think as we've gone through the evidence, we've also sort of proven that's not the case. Um, I think the other point is that because this is untrue, and we know it is, the police logs clearly show, don't they, that not only did Jeremy call the police, but Neville Bamber, never, Neville Bamber also called the police on that night and the logs you know the prosecution say were mixed up and uh, the timing was wrong so that couldn't have happened no it did and the logs are there to prove it the prosecution wants you to believe that the logging officers got the times wrong starting stating that the officers read the digital clock wrong um, <laughs> I don't know how they're going to say it the radio logs were also wrong, saying that they didn't um, speak to anyone or see anybody at all, even when Jeremy Bamber was outside, right, and looked through that window. So, and that was the same body, was that the same body that they saw through that window, the same body that they found upstairs? If it was, then that's it. If not, then we've got a body that's disappeared, haven't we? Or are the prosecution correct in saying that all these police officers and all this stuff is wrong. You know, it's up to you what you believe. The crime scene negatives show that there's no markings on the mantelpiece above the fireplace. But four weeks later show the marks that there are. Uh, you know, and this elusive silencer that was used to create these marks to have the paint from the fireplace mantelpiece on it and also had the blood from Sheila on it which turned out that really wasn't, and that evidence has all been disputed. So that's another mark against the prosecution's case. So the silence was discovered and handed in to the police by a family member who helped incriminate Jeremy Bamber. The family that Jeremy states that set him up. Now he states that, not me, and they are financially benefiting from this or from his prosecution. And that's what he states. Now why would they hand in a silencer that has got blood on it that they say now is from an animal? Also has got paint on it from a wall that was meant to be damaged on the crime scene but it's now proven that it wasn't. It was done after. I'll leave that one up to you to decide to whether you believe that Jeremy Bamber is telling the truth when he says his family and a police officer have set him up. The statement, and the, this is what the prosecution wanted you to believe, of Julie Mugford, this jilted ex-lover, this woman that wanted to be the lady of the manor, have all the money. The relationship was over. She was already now benefiting, wasn't she, from the deal, really. The prosecution you know, said that she would face no charges for the fraud that she had done. There was drug offences as well, I think, in there, for the theft also. And I've told you that she also financially benefited from that and on 25,000, nearly about, nearly about 76,000 pounds in today's money. So she financially benefited as well as benefited, you know, her career benefited as well. She also got on a plane after this and went off to make a new life in Canada where she is now a teacher. So according to the defence team, uh, Sheila had been killed around 3.30am in the morning. 
Now, the prosecution said that the blood would have congealed by 9am. Now, if the police officers are writing what they say, whether they was talking to someone or they'd seen someone that was moving in that house, and they didn't get in there till late, the blood, she was, when her body was found, the blood was wet. So the time of death was wrong. And I've said this before in other cases, when the time of death is wrong, a lot of people, you know, can get away with murder if the time of death is really important. You know, it's really important. Now, it's summer, it's August time, isn't it? You know, but there's only a few hours really gone past. Don't forget, they waited like four hours for the, you know, um, police to come, you know, the, with the weapons and stuff to be able to enter this home. Uh, so she should have. She was dead at 3:30 a.m. Then her blood shouldn't have been wet. Her body was wet when they found her. The, the blood was still wet. It was no way congealed. So there's other little bits and pieces here that really don't add up. Also, this argument on the silencer and really the silencer, I think, is the whole prosecution's case, isn't it? That's what it really comes down to. And I've said before, if the silencer didn't make the marks on the wall, didn't have the red paint on from the wall, didn't have the blood on on the night of the crime, and that was done after, then the silencer is out of the equation and the, and the prosecution, the whole case, theory of this is out the window. That's how important the silencer is in this. It really, really is. And then we look at the evidence when they say about even if the silencer was on the gun, okay, they actually said that Sheila wouldn't have been able to have killed herself with the silence from the gun. That was also proven to be untrue. Uh, yes, it was. It was also proven that when you have the two gunshots, that someone can shoot themselves twice uh, and die from it. But there, it's where the, the issue with the gunshot is that so many people only saw one and then there was two. There's big issues here and there's big issues of how this case and this evidence was put across to a jury that come, you know, with a verdict of 10 to 2, um, that, you know, really on circumstantial evidence in this case. It's, it's really bad, you know. Um, so I think when we consider everything and we consider the crime scene photos, the logs, the phone call from not only Jeremy Bamba, but Neville Bamba, the mix-up in the times, if that's what you want to believe, that the prosecution is saying from the logs and stuff and the radio logs and stuff. Um, there's a lots of ifs and buts here, isn't there? Lots of ifs and buts. How much can this place get wrong? Before you start thinking, well, are they wrong? How many mistakes could they have made in this? Yes, they made mistakes after the crime scene. They touched the crime scene, they tainted evidence, they moved things, they moved the body and different things like this. And the gun in there could have gone off a second time by accident. There was, you know, and that could come down to human error because you're worried when you're entering a crime scene where you're entering, you don't know if the person's still alive, if you're going to be shot. You are on tender hooks. So there's a lot that could have happened in this case. But I don't think what could have happened is that Jeremy Bamba could not be in two places at once. He couldn't have been. And if there is logs that prove that Neville Bamba and Jeremy Bamba made phone calls, then that's all the proof they need to say that he didn't do it. That's it. So I don't understand with this case why the confusion and why this man has been really... Um, refused many, many times appeals to bring this evidence back into it. And I think with Sheila herself, her state of mind at the time, she was a paranoid schizophrenic. She was found with cannabis in her system and it had been clear that her state of mind at the time, that she believed that she was God, that she believed her children were devil's children and that she believed that she could make people do evil things. And, um, and she also believed that her husband and others were out to kill her. 
to me when you just look at Sheila and this case in, in its total, take away all the other stuff around it, you know, the actual facts, the evidence here, you know, evidence that needs to be brought back in. I don't think this has ever have gone that far. I think I think the worst thing here is for his defence team when I've read this, you know, and they've missed critical evidence, they've they've their lack of ability when you're trying to fight for someone's liberty. Um it's it's shocking really. And I can understand why a lot of people are behind Jeremy Bamba and have been for many, many years fighting this conviction. Because of the how bad it is. And I think again it's it's what it says about English justice. Uh, is it that easy to fit someone up for a crime that they didn't do? I think it is. You know, and to suit the evidence that make it fit. I think in this instance, the first a load of um, investigators and, and police officers were correct in saying that this was a murder-suicide and that Sheila Caffell killed her mother, her father and her two sons and then shot herself. I think the other version that you've been told and that's been sold out there in its, you know, uh, drama series and all this stuff, it's just that just about drama and it, it's not the truth and the truth must always come out in law or else what's the point so I don't believe in suppressing evidence I believe in if there is evidence that a court needs to see then they need to see it and they need to see it in the true facts of it not in the made up facts and so you can't keep saying officers are wrong or this didn't happen when there's actually evidence that the logs were there. Because if you needed them, police logs, to prosecute someone, you'd be saying they were right, wouldn't you? But on this case, the prosecution said that them logs were wrong. The police got it wrong. The timing was wrong. He read the time wrong. He must have read the time wrong. You know, you can't have it all ways. If we're going to believe the police, when they log stuff and their radio logs and everything, then we use that as evidence. You can't dispute it because it doesn't fit your story. And I think this is the whole case with this case in total. It was literally a made up story from the beginning. It was just a murder suicide. Tragic, yes. People died, yes. But that's really what it was. And it's been made into much, much more, really. And it's a really shocking case, this one. I hope you've enjoyed this case. I can tell you, honestly, I haven't enjoyed researching this at all. It's been one of the most complicated research tools um, and things that I've used and had to do because of the complexity of it, of the hidden stuff, of you know, the lies and, and, and the deceit, which is clearly in this, and also how it was put together. You know, the evidence was clearly there at the beginning. People disputed it. It's just such a terrible case, this, and it's a terrible one to work on, to tell the truth. Anyway, I wish Jeremy Bamba all the luck, because I think he's going to need it. Because this evidence has been around since about 2010. We're in 2021. Anyway, you know what to do. Um, follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on Facebook. You can catch us on Spotify with the other ones that I haven't put up yet, but I am going to put them up. Been really busy. Thank you to all my partners in crime. I will list you here, definitely. Also, you will see down here, I think, I'm going to, the next case is the um, Robert Black case. Child Snatcher, so if you don't like them sort of cases, that one is not for you. That will be coming up in a couple of days, so I'm just going to do that and get that out quickly. So thank you for watching. You know what to do. Thumbs up, you know, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And until the next time, bye-bye.